You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Thomas Sampson of the London School of Economics. Thomas, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thanks for having me on the show. So our topic for today is the economic impact of Brexit. Uh, Longtime listeners will recall that I did an interview with Sam Bowman on Brexit immediately after the vote occurred. So think of this as a follow-up to that episode. Now that the dust has settled and we have a better idea of, you know, what is Brexit going to look like. So Thomas has written multiple papers on the subject. Uh, The one in particular we're going to be discussing is called Brexit, the Economics of International Disintegration, which is forthcoming in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. So Thomas, your paper makes a point of saying that the globalization and economic integration that have been, they've both been on more or less a constant rise since World War II. And and Brexit is, is this rare reversal of the trend. So start by briefly describing, you know, what, what was this trend from 1945 to 2016? And, and what did it mean for the global economy? Well, if you think back to kind of the immediate aftermath of, of World War II, That was the period when the kind of economic institutions that would end up governing the rules of the world economy for the post-war period were were established. So that's institutions like the, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. But then also the one that is relevant for thinking about international trade is what was called the general agreement on on tariffs and trade. So this was the organization that would later in in 1995 become the World Trade Organization. And it provided a forum for countries to come together and negotiate reductions in in trade barriers. And when we talk about trade barriers in this post-war era, we're mainly talking about tariffs. So it provided a forum for negotiating reductions on tariffs between countries. And over the kind of 50 or 60 years following the Second World War, under the auspices of, of the GATT and then the WTO, there was a gradual reduction in in tariff barriers. So tariffs fell and this helped stimulate um, increases in in trade. And most of the evidence suggests that these increases in trade have been economically beneficial. Typically, trade creates losers as well as winners, but on aggregate countries have tended to benefit from this increased trade. Yeah, so so this was a you know a good trend. It uh, we all got richer for sixty years, uh, and uh, we started trading more. But the European Union, in particular, was about not just uh, reduction of trade barriers, but also migration barriers as well. Uh, and which, of course, was very relevant in in the Brexit vote and the politics around it. So, do, do you want to talk about the? free movement of how we sort of globalized in terms of the free movement of of people as well? Yeah, I mean, the the European Union is a really kind of interesting area from a kind of economic perspective and for thinking about economic integration. If we kind of just go back to to GATT and WTO for a second, one of the features of, of, of that institution is that it was multilateral. All the members kind of participated together and they jointly agreed on what the uh, trade reductions would be. The other way that trade has been liberalized in recent years is through instead of you know multilateral organizations where many countries get together, through kind of pairs or groups of countries forming their own free trade agreements. And most commonly, these, these groups have been kind of regionally based. So in, in North America, you have, have NAFTA between the US, Canada and, and Mexico. And the big regional trade agreement in Europe has been the one that has taken place under the European Union. So the European Union had a kind of free trade area and a customs union going back to the 1960s. But then in the 1990s, it decided it wanted to go beyond what would traditionally be in a free trade area. So a traditional free trade area would really be about reducing tariffs, maybe doing something to kind of 
harmonize or t- harmonize standards across countries to a limited extent to try and make it easier for firms from one country to sell in another country. Uh, but they wouldn't really make, you know, adopt policies that would affect anything other than kind of what goes on at the border between countries. What the European Union did in the 1990s when it set up the single market was to go far beyond that and to set up kind of an, an economic infrastructure that was designed to reduce barriers to trade, not just at international borders, but also behind borders. Right. So what does that mean? Well, pro- one good example is that you know, within the European Union, for areas that are covered by the single market, regulations, you know, the regulations that determine product standards and that determine, you know, what characteristics products must be have to put, be put on the European market, they're harmonized across countries. So what that means is that if a firm in the United Kingdom produces a product following UK rules, it will automatically be able to sell that product throughout all the other countries in the European Union, which wouldn't necessarily be the case if it was trying to sell in the US or Canada, for example. So in order to create this single market, the EU reached not just to the border, but behind the border. And it did that in terms of trade in products and services, but also, as you've mentioned, at the same time, in terms of movement of labor. So the single market is based on the idea that there are four freedoms. So these are the freedom to move of goods and of services and of capital. And then crucially, the fourth freedom is of of workers. So this allows for free migration of of workers across European countries, which has become been a very controversial point politically and played a key role in the Brexit referendum. Yeah, yeah. So as we all know, in 2016, there was the Brexit referendum and it, you know, the uh, uh, narrow majority voted to to leave the European Union. We should also mention there was a, a currency union as well, although the UK kept the Great British Pound. Uh, so, so that was one element. Yeah, that, that, I uh, mean, that's an important point, right? In that the, there have been a lot of economic issues around the the adoption of the euro and the effect that the common monetary policy has had on countries. But none of them are really relevant for talking about the UK because the UK isn't part of that. But uh, they, may, they may be relevant if we're, uh, I think, later in this conversation, we'll discuss trends in, in uh, economic integration or disintegration, and that may be relevant. But we, we all know that there was this referendum, the leave vote uh, won unexpectedly. And now uh, the British government has this obligation to leave the the EU. But the the vote didn't say specifically, you know, exactly under what conditions, under what terms. And there's talk of um, the current government could opt for or the negotiation process could lead to what some people call a hard Brexit or a soft Brexit. Um, tell us a little bit about that negotiation process and what, what the stakes are. The key question for for both the United Kingdom and for the European Union is what kind of relationship will they have, both economic and political, following Brexit? So at one extreme, when the UK leaves the European Union, it could just have similar relationships. Uh, the, The relationship between them could just be similar to the kinds of relationship countries typically have when they have no special relationship. So this would mean that trade between the UK and the European Union will be governed by the World Trade Organization, which we've already discussed, and there would be no kind of ongoing political integration. So that's what people refer to as a hard Brexit. It would mean that there would be tariffs on trade between the UK and the EU, and there would no longer be this regulatory harmonization that I've talked about, um, which ensures that UK and EU producers face the same product standards. So that's kind of that's kind of one extreme. And then if the UK and the EU decide, you know, we don't want that kind of hard Brexit, we do want to maintain some kind of special relationship. There's a range of forms that relationship could take. So they could seek to negotiate a free trade agreement to reduce tariffs and to um, take some steps to allow for kind of trade in services across the countries. Uh, Many people point to the recent agreement between the EU and, and Canada as a possible template for what a uh, UK-EU free trade agreement could, could look like. 
Um, or alternatively, if, if they want to maintain even closer economic integration, the UK could actually remain in the European single market while leaving the European Union if it joins an organization called the European Economic Area. Right? So there's a lot of different acronyms with very similar names um, coming up in this conversation. But what the European Economic Area is, is it's a way for European countries that don't want the full political integration of the European Union, but do want to be part of the, the kind of economic integration and the single market for them to access that. So at the moment, countries like Norway and Iceland are, are members of that. So that would be another potential option that could be considered for the future of UK-EU relations. Yeah, it's, it sounds like there, there are some options on the table uh, that amount to sort of Brexit in name only. So you're, you're officially not in the EU, but if you, if you have the same – you, you can – set up a, a set of agreements that are almost equivalent to membership in the EU, uh, s specifically if you're, if you're in the, uh, the common market and, uh, you know, and, and you make trade deals with, with the countries that are similar to, uh, to the previous ones. But uh, one thing I learned from your paper is that the negotiation process has a, a hard deadline. So the formal notification from the United Kingdom to the European Union was on March 29th. 2017. And that means that on March 29th, 2019, Britain will just automatically be out of the EU, whether they've reached an agreement or not. Uh, first, where does that rule come from? And, and wh what are the implications if of that, both for the negotiations and if they don't reach an agreement? Yeah. The rules that govern this process come from something called Article 50 of the uh, Lisbon Treaty, which is one of the treaties that governs how the European Union functions. Now, when this treaty was, was written, no one really expected that a country would actually decide to, to leave the European Union. So Article 50 is actually fairly vague and was probably never intended to be, to be used. So pretty much the only definitive thing it does is set this two-year period within which exit negotiations are supposed to be supposed to take place. Now, that two-year period can be extended, but only with unanimous agreement of both the UK and all the 27 other EU countries. So that would be pretty hard to get. So as you say, it is likely that the UK will have to leave the uh, EU by March 2019 at the, at the latest. Right. So that then raises the question of what exactly are we going to talk about before March 2019? Because Article 50, you know, what it specifies you have to talk about is really only the kind of divorce side of the negotiations. And so you can think about the kind of issues that face the UK and the EU at the moment. There's the, the divorce issue. How are we going to unentangle our existing relationship? But then there's also the future relationship, which we've been talking about the options for already. So during this two-year period, they definitely need to attempt to come to a deal on the divorce, right? which will be talking about issues like the financial settlement. It's widely believed that the UK will have to pay a divorce bill to the EU. And also questions like, what happens to UK citizens that are living in European countries and European citizens that are currently living in the UK? What rights do they have after the UK leaves the EU? So there are these really complex issues that have to be settled before the UK exits, then there's the future relationship. Now, Article 50 only says that you have to talk about the framework for a future relationship, not the details of what the relationship will be. So it's likely that finalizing what that future relationship will be probably won't be concluded as part of the exit negotiations, but will probably continue after the UK has formally left the European Union. Okay. So uh, there's still uncertainty, it sounds like, in, you know, how things are going to work out and, you know, what, what uh, you know, your status will be if you want to, uh, if you're in the UK and you want to trade with continental Europe or you're in continental Europe and you want to trade with the UK or migrate or, or do something else. But we can start to look at what the, uh, the immediate economic consequences were of uh, of the the referendum uh, you have your figure one in your uh, in your paper is uh, a graph that shows um, the the exchange rate between the US dollar and the great British pound as well as real wage growth in the UK and CPI inflation in the UK and there's a, a sudden fall the moment uh, the vote occurs the referendum 
caused a, a sudden fall in the in the value of the Great British Pound against the U.S. dollar. And then you also see sort of it, it's more gradual, but there's a fall in the real wa- wage growth and a rise gradually in CPI inflation. So um, tell me, what, what's the intuition for, for those results? Why, why might uh, an international trade theorist expect that to happen when you have this uh, this uh, divorce between the UK and um, and the EU. I think it's worth by worth starting saying by saying that the kind of international sort of the the knowledge we have about international trade and the theories we have about international trade kind of on their own are not necessarily the the best tools to think about these kind of short run effects and what happens to the exchange rate. So, I mean, I think we'll come on to talk about this in a bit, but the you know, models and ideas and data we have on international trade do suggest that this Brexit process is likely to be um, bad for the UK economically. Um, but they don't specifically tell us about you know how that how the adjustment to the Brexit shock will happen, or exactly what will happen to the economy in the short run. I mean, what we have seen though, you know, in looking in the short run following the referendum is, you know, the big shock was the depreciation of sterling, right? And that seemed to reflect, um, you know, the kind of view of participants in the foreign exchange market that Brexit was a negative shock to the UK economy, which was likely to harm the UK's economic performance over the medium of long and longer term. And because you know, financial markets tend to react very quickly, that led to an immediate depreciation in the value of the, the British pound before anything else occurred. Now, once that depreciation had occurred, we're kind of on firmer ground understanding what the effects of that depreciation will be. Right? A weaker sterling meant that the cost of imports into the UK rose. Right? And this increase in import prices has been the factor responsible for driving up inflation in the, the UK. And we've seen inflation, the inflation rate in the UK rise by more than two percentage, more than two percentage points over the past year. And with nominal wage growth being unaffected, this has led to a decline in real wage growth in the UK, such that currently real wage growth in the UK is in fact negative. Right? So I think, it, I mean, it's certainly too soon to say anything about the longer run effect of Brexit for no other reason than we haven't left the European Union yet. But you know, clearly there have been some negative short run consequences. And the main place that shows up is in this negative real wage growth due to the higher cost of imports. Yeah, and and just uh, yeah, the the fall in the exchange rate. Uh, just the in, intuitively, if you have higher higher cost of trade, then you know you have fewer people demanding your goods, and therefore fewer people you know uh, going to the foreign exchange foreign exchange market to to demand your currency, and uh, and so you you would expect the value of your currency. To fall right now in anticipation of that future reduction in trade. You know, similarly, I, I live in Canada, and uh, you know, every time since our major export is oil, every time the price of oil falls, our, our currency does as well. Um, yeah, exactly. I think that I think that's totally right. Yeah, an anticipated trade shock uh, caused an immediate shock to the the foreign exchange market, and not not only that, but. Uh, you know, even even if we have you have a soft Brexit and and the you know UK politicians manage neg- to negotiate uh, of staying in the European Economic Area and things stay mostly as they were, you still have this um, you know this risk premium and until that day comes until we know exactly what it's going to look like, uh, you'd expect doing any kind of business between the UK and the EU to, to carry with it a significant risk that uh, you may ha- see a, a huge increase in, in your costs of doing business, you know, uh, two years down the road when uh, when things have worked out and the UK is truly out of the EU. Right. Yeah. I think if you're a, if you're a firm at the moment, thinking about making a, an investment that's going to pl- pay off in you know two years or more into the future, and in which the payoff from that investment is going to depend on being able to continue easy access to EU markets, you are going to think twice about making that investment. So the, you know, the, there is this 
concerned that the uncertainty effect will have a kind of put a chill on investment. Yeah. So, um, do you want uh, your your paper reviews many of the. Uh, much of the research that people have done uh, about the potential effect on on trade. Um, do you want to talk about the way people have, have sort sort of gone about sim- simulating the effect of Brexit and the the future effect on on the country's trade and, and GDP and output? So, kind of forecasting, you know, what effect Brexit might have is kind of a difficult challenge. And that's primarily because there's no real precedent for Brexit. We don't have a historical case that we can study where a major economy like the UK has left a body like the European Union. So in the absence of you know, compelling historical evidence that can tell us what the economic effects of Brexit might be, economists have kind of adopted three different approaches to trying to understand how Brexit might affect the UK and, and European economies. Um, now, none of these approaches is is perfect, and they all have their their limitations, but they do help shed some light on what the the consequences might be. So, the first approach that's been taken has been to look at what happened when countries joined the EU. So if we're willing to assume that the effect of leaving the EU would simply be the opposite of the effect of joining, then if we can understand what happened when countries joined the EU, that would tell us something about what the economic effects of Brexit are likely to be. So, for example, the UK joined the uh, European Community, which is what the EU was called at the time in, in 1973. So some economists have studied what that did to the UK's economy. And typically, they've found kind of strong positive Effect. So there's one study that finds 10 years after the UK joined, its GDP per capita was 8.6% higher than they estimate it would have been if the UK had remained outside the EU. Now, obviously, disentangling the effects of EU membership from all the other things going on in the economy at that time, I mean, that period in the 70s is the period of the kind of big oil price shocks. That's a really difficult challenge. But you know, the best evidence we have, or, you know, the best attempt people have made at this seems to find a positive effect. Right. So that's, that's the first approach that's been tried. The second approach has been to use kind of what we know about international trade and about the relationship between international trade and income and to simulate Brexit in structural models of international trade. So the idea here would be you you take a model of the global economy that you think is a good fit for observed patterns of trade, right? Now in that model, trade and all the other outcomes are going to depend on what the trade barriers between countries look like. So you can start with a situation where the trade barriers are between the UK and the EU are essentially zero because of EU membership, and then you can raise those barriers to simulate Brexit. The big kind of modeling question you face there is how big should the increase in barriers from Brexit be? So typically, people have considered a range of alternatives based on different assumptions about what Brexit might be. The kind of, you know, would it be the softer Brexit or the harder Brexit that we talked about earlier? So we did, I did some work on this myself together with some colleagues at the, the LSE. Um, our estimate when we do that is that a, a soft Brexit where the UK stays in the single market would be equivalent to a 1.3% fall in living standards in the UK, whereas a harder Brexit would be a 2.7% fall. Right? So these numbers aren't, aren't huge, but you can see that they're, you know, they're suggesting there would be a cost to the UK, um, and that cost would be much bigger if the UK didn't stay in the single market. I see from your paper that uh, that some people have higher estimates than that. Um, so, you, for instance, you cite uh, Ferrer's estimate uh, that uh, implies a 6.3 to 9.4% fall. Uh, so, you see your, your own estimates as fairly optimistic compared to uh, to the rest of the literature? Yeah, certainly these estimates of kind of a, you know, a one or two percent cost, they are at the, the lower end of estimates that have been produced. I think, you know, I, I say at some point in the paper that I think the kind of plausible range of estimates that are out there is somewhere between one percent and ten percent. Right? So that's telling you that there is a huge degree of uncertainty over exactly how big these effects would be. Um, and I think, you know, so what one of the reasons some of these um, effects 
are getting uh, some of these estimates are getting much bigger effects than these kind of model based estimates I've been talking about is that when we simulate the Brexit shock in the model, we hold the technologies constant, which is to say that we affect we assume that kind of Brexit affects whether the UK specializes in one industry or another industry, but it doesn't affect the productivity of industries in the UK. Now, there is a body of evidence that suggests that increased trade also has effects on productivity. So estimates that take that into account, which is the kind of final set of estimates, they do tend to get these bigger effects, right? Going up towards, you know, over 5%, certainly. So some of this uncertainty is coming from kind of not quite knowing how big these productivity effects and maybe also foreign direct investment effects might be. The more important they're likely to be, the bigger the costs uh, we think will be. Yeah, yeah. Um, you talk about uh, foreign di- direct investment and also um, the reduction in labor mobility as a result of uh, of Brexit. Uh, you know, h- h- how do you expect those to be a- affected by a, a hard Brexit, uh, presumably they'd be much reduced. Absolutely. In ta- I mean, taking them in term, for foreign, foreign direct investment, the UK is generally quite an attractive place to invest. It's you know, frequently the leading destination for foreign direct investment in Europe. And some of, the, some of the reasons people invest in the UK have nothing to do with the EU. Speaking English is an advantage. Having a relatively high-skilled labor force is an advantage. But another reason people invest in the UK is to access the single market. And if the UK were to leave the single market, companies that come to the UK because they know that they will be able to sell to the EU with minimal trade barriers are less likely to invest in the UK. So there's particular concern in this area over what will happen to the UK car industry, which has actually been an export success for the UK over the past 10 or 15 years. There's been rapid growth in car exports from the UK. But a lot of the car production in the UK is designed specifically for exporting to Europe. So whether those kind of investments will continue in the UK if we were to leave the single market is highly, highly doubtful. Then the other issue, obviously, is is immigration, which is a very salient political issue within the UK. Um, and one of the main reasons people supported leaving the EU was in order to be able to put greater restrictions on immigration from the European Union. So the general expectation is that unless the UK stays in the single market, it is likely to adopt an immigration regime that puts much tighter restrictions on the ability of European workers to come to the UK. So we would probably expect to see falls in immigration to the UK um, in the years to come. Yeah. So let, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about that immigration. So when the Soviet Union fell and a lot of the, the Eastern European states were dramatically poorer than uh, than the, the Western European ones. And so having a, a European Union with freedom of migration between those very poor and, and very relatively rich countries really produced a lot of uh, economic migration, which, of course, was uh, controversial, but from an economic perspective, you know, you have... Uh, general equilibrium in labor markets generally makes uh, uh, makes a country more productive, not less. Even even if you're bringing in low income people, does lower your may lower your average. You know your GDP per capita generally increases your your productivity overall and the productivity of uh, most of the people who were there initially. Uh, so, do, do you think uh, comment on that uh, this the sort of uh, migration patterns produced by the EU uh, and, and, and comment on them as, as a source of political strain. So I, I guess a useful starting point for talking about that is simply to note that the UK has received a lot of migration from the EU in uh, recent years, particularly after the Eastern European countries, which were formerly part of the, you know, the, the, the Soviet bloc, after they joined the European Union, uh, most of which was uh, it occurred in 2004. So, you know, to give some some data on that, the share of EU nationals in the UK's population it rose from 1.5% to 5.3% between 1995 and 2015. So, you know, it more than trebled during that time period, right? And this 
this big flow of immigration into the UK is what has triggered a lot of these concerns among large segments of the UK population about whether immigration is good for the for the UK. And particularly the kind of the concern that has been most highlighted is whether immigration from Eastern European countries reduces wages in the UK. And particularly, you know, there's a special concern that because there might be putting the immigration might be putting downward pressure on the wages of the least skilled and the and the lowest paid workers in the UK. So you know, what can we say about that in terms of the the data? Is there actually any evidence that low skilled UK workers have suffered from immigration? Well, the answer to that is maybe a teeny bit, but probably not very much, and certainly not enough to kind of offset the other benefits that the UK has received from immigration. So there's a couple of studies that have been done, uh, one by Nicol and Salahin and another by Dustman, Frattini and Preston, which do find evidence that immigration has had small negative effect on wages at the very bottom of the wage distribution. So, for example, the, the Dustman and his co-authors, their estimates imply that for workers in the bottom te- decile, so the bottom 10% of the wage distribution, um, immigration from the European Union between 2004 and 2015 reduced their wages by 1%. Right? So there is some truth to the idea that there are these unwelcome distributional effects of immigration. At the same time, when these studies look at average wages, they certainly don't find negative effects and they quite frequently find some small positive. So there's really no evidence that the UK as a whole has suffered from immigration, but it has raised these distributional concerns, which certainly played a role in the Brexit vote. Yeah, uh, that's that's very consistent with uh, immigration research uh, elsewhere in the world. For instance, there's a broad, there's a big literature about the the Mariel boat lift uh, situation where, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of Cuban immigrants uh, escaping uh, Castro regime increased Miami's uh, labor force by by like 8% overnight. And so it's a very good natural experiment. And you found similar thing, like maybe maybe a little uh, more unemployment among um, the very low skilled uh, native born workers, you know, high school dropouts. But in general, most people are better off. And there's multiple reasons for that. You know, you labor, you could be if you're a low-skilled worker, maybe your labor is a substitute for for uh, poor immigrants' labor. But you know, if you're a high-skilled worker, say you're you're a great manager, you know, suddenly there are a whole lot more workers for you to manage, and you become more valuable. And not only that, but uh, you might see uh, things like uh, poor immigrants provide low-cost childcare. You might see more people in in higher earning jobs participating in the labor force. There's sort of a lot of a lot of indirect effects of having uh having this uh freedom of movement for for low skilled workers uh and uh i mean and of course of course there's also high skilled immigration but uh i think there's basically a consensus that that's a good thing and uh and doesn't get nearly as much discussion yeah so uh let, let's uh let's move to the uh the political side of things your paper says that uh that we you know understanding why you know the brexit vote turned out the way it did is really important for understanding how things might turn out in the future whether this is just a you know a one time stumble on the road to greater uh, international integration or if it's you know the first domino to fall before the whole uh, the whole uh, European Union breaks apart uh, in the in the sort of worst case scenario so uh, tell me a little bit about that so the referendum result came as a shock. No one, you know, certainly the expectation was that Britain would vote to to stay in the EU. And you know, as we've alluded to already, there isn't really any precedent for a country deciding to leave an economic area of this form. So, you know, that naturally raises the question, you know, is this the the turning of the tide? Does Brexit mark the start of an era of deglobalization that will lead to the emergence of, of new trade barriers between countries. Right? As we said, this hasn't really happened since the Second World War. But if you look at the interwar period and the aftermath of the Great Depression, that was a period where kind of globalization went into retreat and uh, trade between countries got harder. 
So, you know, does Brexit mark kind of a second wave of, of deglobalization or is it just something that's kind of unique to the special ideas the UK has about what relationship it wants to have with Europe and kind of, you know, will we look back on Brexit in a decade's time and think, you know, well, it mattered for the UK, but it wasn't really very informative about what was going to you know, happen in the rest of the, the world. And I think to answer this question, we need to say something about, you know, why did Britain vote for Brexit? Why did we get this surprising referendum result? And what, you know, what does it tell us about, you know, what the causes of support for Brexit were? So um, what would be evidence uh, for this as a UK specific event? Uh, if, if you're if you're looking at um, the circumstances of Brexit, are there specific U- UK related things that drove it to Brexit that could plausibly only apply to the UK and maybe not uh, many other countries in the EU or, or in other international agreements? I, I mean, I think the place to start for thinking about that is, you know, who was it who actually voted for for Brexit? If we look at the demographics of the Brexit vote, where did support for Brexit come from. So, you know, there have been a number of studies that have been done quite quickly after the referendum looking at this. And what they do is paint a picture of a Britain that is really kind of split down the middle, particularly on the basis of kind of of four variables, geography, age, education, and ethnicity. So support for the, the leave vote, typically it came from England, but not from Scotland or or Northern Ireland. So, you know, overall, England supported leave, Wales supported leave, where Scotland and Northern Ireland voted remain. Within England, there was also an important division between London and the rest of the country. Uh, Within London, only uh, 40% of people voted to leave, whereas in the rest of England, it was 53%. So there's kind of, you know, a split between the capital and the rest of the country. What we also saw was that Uh, More educated voters were more likely to vote to remain in the EU, as were younger voters. There was a strong age effect in this vote. The older voters overwhelmingly backed leave, whereas among the youngest category in the data, 18 to 24-year-olds, only 27% of voters backed leave. Right. And then, you know, the final kind of you know demographic split that's interesting to look at is, you know, white voters backed leave. Uh, but you know, ethnic minority groups tended to vote remain. So Britain was pretty split along a number of different dimensions. And the way a lot of people have, you know, characterized what we see in these in, in this data is that the people who supported leave and the kind of where leave got its majority from was what people have referred to as left behind voters. Right. So these are Voters that, you know, have in some way been struggling, either, you know, economically, voters that have been, you know, have performed worse economically were more likely to vote leave, but also voters that maybe felt alienated from uh, kind of cosmopolitan metropolitan, the kind of cosmopolitan metropolitan culture that is very prevalent in places like London and, you know, to a lesser extent, other big towns in the in the UK. So one way to see this vote is it's kind of a rebellion by these left behind voters against the establishment and against kind of more what you might think of as more progressive, less socially conservative values. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, that would seem to be a point in favor of this being not the first uh you know, exit in in a series of of countries closing themselves off because, of course, you know, if it's older voters who wanted to vote to leave and younger voters who wanted to vote to stay, well, you know, the the older voters are going to uh, to die off and the younger voters are going to become the new majority. So, you know, if their preferences stay what they are now, you'd expect the the population of 20 years from now, 30 years from now, to be much more in favor of these international agreements and, and staying staying in, in organizations like the EU. Um, and, you know, then uh, with the additional assumption that, that maybe other countries have, have something similar in terms of their, their demographics and, and their support for, uh, for international organizations, you know, uh, you, you'd expect 
greater in for, uh, integration on, on that evidence. Do you think that's a uh, fair interpretation? Yeah, I mean, I think a really interesting question here is, did these voters support leaving the EU because they objected or, you know, they opposed something fundamental about the EU? Or was it simply that they were unhappy, uh, you know, with the, with how they were doing economically and with the direction society was headed in? And they chose to blame the EU uh, for their struggles. My sense is that at this stage, we don't know which of those explanations is more important. Right? There's certainly some evidence that UK voters do tend to scapegoat the EU for their difficulties. The most of the UK press campaigned to leave the EU and British politicians have a long history of you know, taking credit for things that go well and blaming the EU for things that, that go badly. So certainly the EU has a bit of a kind of PR problem in the UK, and that could explain part of the vote. But then also you know, key parts of the Leave campaign were the, you know, the opposition to free movement of, of, of workers between the UK and the EU, and also this idea that the UK needed to take back control from the EU. Right? So part of being the EU is you, in, in the EU is you sign up to kind of EU economic policy and EU economic regulations. And there seemed to be you know, a sizable constituency among Leave voters who felt that this was just an undesirable limitation on Britain's national sovereignty. So to the extent that that is really what, what drove the vote, I think it suggests a more fundamental problem for institutions like the EU. Because if people are unwilling to kind of pool sovereignty at, a, you know, in this case, at a regional, at a European level, you know, that's a fundamental part of what makes the what makes up the European Union. And if that if that is what people are objecting to, I think it's kind of more troubling for the long term future of, of the EU. Yeah, I, some of those older voters, uh, you know, if they're if they're they they may have grown up in an age when uh, when Britain still had uh, had its empire and uh, and was, you know, the the sort of a dominant power in in global politics and uh, you know in the in the fading days of its empire and uh, and throughout the course of their lifetime they went from that you know when they were very young to uh to a situation where you know someone from portugal could dictate uh you know their the regulation on their agricultural <laughs> goods or, or or something uh you know they it, going from this uh country with not only its own sovereignty but ruling a big chunk of the world to you know being a you know it's subject to to a larger international body and only being a small part of it so you can sort of see how an older voter might uh might see that loss of sovereignty as as the loss of something something important something uh that they saw as part of their national identity do you think that was a lot of the similar explanations, besides the sovereignty part, but the, the left behind voter kind of uh, explanation, you see sort of a similar pattern in people's explanations for why a populist candidate was elected in, in the United States right around the same time. Do you have uh, thoughts on 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 that on the on either of those issues? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a really interesting question, and it's one where. Clearly, we are in need of more research to understand, you know, where this new populism comes from. So there's, you know, one really interesting study that was done after the referendum was by um, two Italian economists, Colantoni and, and Stanek. Um, and they built upon this kind of, you know, literature that has shown that the increase in import competition from China has had um, negative effects on economic outcomes in labor, low, kind of local labor markets in the in the U.S. So, you know, what they did was they took this idea that the kind of the, the China shock and the effect of increased import competition from China can have region specific effects in developed countries, and they applied that to the Brexit vote. And they asked, did regions that were more exposed to import competition from China did that affect? The, you know, the share of voters in that region that voted for leave. And they do find an effect. They find that regions where there's more import competition from China had a higher share of the vote voting for, for leave. So the 
import competition effect seemed to increase support for leave. Now, the effect quantitatively is quite small. It doesn't explain very much of the difference in vote shares across regions. So it's clearly far from the main thing that's driving the results. But I think that's, I mean, it's a really interesting finding, partly because, you know, vote, whether you stay in or leave the EU clearly is not going to affect the import competition you are fa- face from China, right? So it's telling us partly that, you know, one of the, th- if, we, if we take this result at face value, it's telling us that one of the things that's going on here is voters are, are voting for what appear to be relations that, reasons that are potentially unrelated to the EU, you know, which could be, you know, that could be more consistent with the idea that, they, you know, they are scapegoating the EU for potentially, you know, problems that come from, from China or from developing countries. At the same time, what it's also suggestive of is that the vote is in some way, a, you know, a populist response to the pressures that globalization brings. And this is potentially where it's more similar to some of the explanations that have been put forward for the support that Trump has, has received, particularly in the Midwest of the US. So it's kind of a really interesting finding, but it's hard to know exactly what it tells us about why Brexit um, occurs. And, and of course, um, you know, if, if we're thinking about uh, whether other countries might leave the EU, um, say maybe Denmark or, or something, that has an impact on the ongoing negotiations. So if uh, the UK gets its soft Brexit, they get a very favorable deal with the EU and, uh, and they get to stay in the common market uh, and say it, it's the the economic cost is at the at the lower end of the estimate so you know 1% uh, another country in the EU might say oh look they they got uh you know they got more sovereignty and they you know they got more control over their own country and uh you know independence and it only costs them you know 1% of their uh their GDP per capita so uh so maybe maybe that uh you know they they might think hey that's a good trade off but knowing that the EU might not want to give them the soft Brexit because it, uh, you know, encourages other countries to potentially leave. So, uh, do, do you want to comment on on that uh, that dynamic in the negotiations? Yeah, I, th- I think it's been fairly clear that the EU's primary objective in the negotiations, and the EU has been fairly explicit about this, it, you know, they're, they're transparent about the negotiating objectives, but that their primary objective is to maintain the kind of institutional integrity and stability of the rest of the European Union. And really, I mean, that has two implications for the kind of deal that might be on the table for the UK. One is that it is important that, as you say, the UK is not seen to be getting a better deal because it leaves the EU. So it's, it's important to demonstrate that there is some kind of, of price from leaving the EU, which is what we expect will indeed be the, be the case. But then the second thing is, I mean, in order to protect the kind of integrity of its existing institutions, things like the customs union and the, the single market, the EU is very keen to prevent the UK sort of cherry picking the ability to remain within some EU institutions, but to opt out of others. So you know, if it, the UK was offered the ability to kind of remain in the single market for goods and for services, while at the same time being able to restrict immigration and potentially have more control over its own economic regulations, I think that idea would be very popular within the UK. But at the moment, that doesn't seem to be on the on the table because the EU has said that the the four freedoms of the single market, the goods, the services, the capital and the labor, they come as a package. And if you want to be part of the single market, you have to accept all of them. So the kind of type of cherry picking the UK might want want to do, the EU is trying to prevent that. And that's you know part of the negotiation dynamic that's going on at the moment. Do you have any closing thoughts? Any anything that uh, that we didn't cover, or that uh, listeners should know more about? I think looking forward, what is going to be you know really interesting is to see how these negotiations between the UK and the EU evolve and where they eventually lead us to. We still know very little at this point about what the final destination looks like. Back in January, the UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, gave a big speech in which she announced that the UK would be leaving the single market and leaving the customs union and that there would be a kind of new, it would forge a new trade policy based on this 
idea of a global Britain that would trade with the rest of the world and, uh, and not with Europe. Um, then, you know, in June this year, the prime minister called an election to get support for this policy. And she was initially expected to win a large majority, but actually she didn't. And she was failed to win a majority. She still was the that her party with the conservatives were the largest party, but they didn't win a majority. And that has undermined her power and control of the Brexit process and has reopened this debate about what exactly the UK wants from Brexit. Does it want to be a more inward-looking country? Uh, does it want to maintain relatively close links with Europe? Or does it want to kind of look away from Europe and instead try and align itself more with, uh, with the US or with, with other countries? And I think you know, the big question for the UK going forward is, you know, do we want to in some way still remain part of the kind of broader European economic sphere where even if we're not within the EU, we continue to kind of mostly adopt similar regulation to the EU? Or do we want to go in a radically new direction and say, realign our, our economic structure and the way we do our economic regulation more with what happens in the, the US, right? And there are certainly, there are elements within the UK that are arguing for that solution and others that say, well, you know, our big natural trading partner is Europe and we need to think about Europe first. And that, that debate is still ongoing and it's going to be really important for, for Britain's future. My guest today has been Thomas Sampson. Thomas, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thanks. I've really enjoyed talking to you. 